I'm going to read the chapter, and then we will uh, kind of go through it a little bit. I want to leave a little time for uh, praying together afterwards. It's not going to go too long, too deep. Uh, it's an interesting section of Scripture. We see Caleb uh, pop back up. This is um, the Caleb who went exploring and was sent out as a scout. Um, he's an interesting character when you, when you kind of dig into him a bit. He's a, um, I think he's a, we can learn a bit from him as men. Uh, men who need to be challenged in life. So I'm going to read and then let's pray. Joshua chapter 14. These are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, uh, priest Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed as an inheritance to them. Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and the half-tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of two tribes and the half-tribe on the other side of the Jordan. We spoke about that last week. But, on, but to the Levites he had given no inheritance among them. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. And they gave no part to the Levites in the land except the cities to dwell in, Within their common lands for their livestock and their pro livestock and their property, as the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jeph Jephune the Kenzanite said to him, "You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was." Forty years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the, pe of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance. And your children's, and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as He said these forty-five years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, eighty-five years old, and yet I am as strong this day as the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. He still had stamina. Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said." And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, 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 as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you again, God, for how it challenges us, um, Lord, to be better, not just by our own strength, but God, by uh, your grace and aligning our eyes with who it is you've made us. Um, not only in the physical, but God, in the spiritual, as you've made us in your image, and you've made us your sons when you saved us. So God, in that, that place uh, that you've given us, I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to be men of strength, men of honor, men of courage, 
Lord, help us, God, to see um, <laughs> what you've done in this man, Caleb, and what we can take from it. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I'm going to reread 1 through 4 real quick. And I'm not going to go over much in 1 through 4. Kind of just a rehash of 13. These are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel, distributed as an inheritance to them. Their inheritance was by lot, a little chunk for each. You look at how it broke up. It was interesting. Some had huge chunks of land, some had little chunks of land. So it's kind of interesting um, how those were broken up. Their inheritance was by lot as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and the half tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half tribe on the other side of the Jordan. Again, we spoke about that last week. But to the Levites, he had given no inheritance among them. For the children of Joseph, Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. And they, gave, and they gave no part to the Levites in the land except the cities to dwell in with their common land for their livestock. And we're going to start getting into um, a bit about Caleb. Caleb is an interesting character. He was not even of the children of Israel. He was an Edomite uh, uh, of, the, of the strain of Esau. And somehow, we don't know exactly, um, he, Caleb is the same word in Hebrew for dog. I don't know if you're familiar with dog in Middle Eastern culture is quite negative, <laughs> to say the least. It's, I mean, as, as we are having this infiltration of, of Muslims coming into Western lands, they're trying to pass laws about not allowing you to even walk a dog because you know, dogs offend them. And so dog in, middle, in, in a Middle Eastern culture was a negative, negative thing. Um, so, some have, have also thought, hey, dogs, dogs are faithful, so maybe it meant that he was faithful. And I think that's a kind of a later add-on to, to who he was, because he was faithful. He was a, a faithful man. Here he was, an outsider. Why would, why would parents name him dog? <laughs> I mean, we don't. There, that could that could point back. This is conjecture. That could point back to a strange family, you know, beginning, strange family life of where he came from. May may give us some insight as to why he's not with his people, why he left his people to be with the children of Israel, and and why he clung to them. He became part of them and in family with them, and and they were. Uh, I mean, by the, by the age of forty, if you look back here in um, Numbers thirteen. By the age of 40, when he was picked by Moses to spy out the land, uh, 13, 1 through 3, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. Everyone a leader among them. So Moses went, so, excuse me, so Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them who were heads of the children of Israel. And in this number, the one that was selected for the head of the children of Israel of the tribe of Judah was Caleb. So at 40, he's already considered a head of the tribe of Judah. Not even, as, not even from natural birth in that tribe. And so his, his uh, obvious leadership qualities stand, must have stood out in that he uh, uh, went in, into that role as leadership, was picked for this very important thing that, that God, God, from God's mouth to Moses' ear to, to Moses getting, gathering people to go to, to fulfill what God had said, he was picked as somebody who was faithful and trustworthy. Then we get to see that these guys go out to the land they come back, and it wasn't a good, most of them returned kind of this, oh no, there's bad things there, as though they didn't know already. They, they understood what was going on in that land, but, but he came with a different report. Um, I'm going to read... 
For the children of Joseph, sorry, as the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua at Gogel, and Caleb, here again, standing in, speaking as leadership with, maybe not leadership of, but leadership with. And the reason I say maybe not leadership of, but because it goes on in 15 and kind of talks about that, that, that he was given land within the land of Judah, and not necessarily that he was, he was calling land for, for all of Judah. So not sure there completely, but he, but he was, uh, definitely came with the leadership uh, to Joshua. Um, and then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me and Kadesh Barnea, the only two people still alive who were there. <laughs> and there, you got to imagine they have a good, we don't know, again, conjecture, but you got to imagine these two guys for, for all these years watching everybody they knew die. And these two men probably comforted each other, probably encouraged each other. We know that Joshua seemed to suffer from uh, a lack of courage. He had to be reminded and encouraged many times. He was courageous, but in, in the midst of all that God had called him to do, God needed to remind him often to be courageous. Did he use Caleb in that? In that? Caleb was a courageous man. Did he use Caleb in that encouragement as a brother? We need, to, we need to do that for one another. We need to be that for one another. Encouraging each other to stand up and do the right thing. Encouraging each other uh, and blessing one another and serving one another. Again, we don't, we don't get to see that full picture. One day we'll get to sit, sit with Joseph and Caleb and it was it like. But unfortunately we don't get to see that now. So here they are, and he, he's reminding Joshua, you were there. Do you remember what happened when we got back? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord. Some things that are obvious about Caleb when you, when you dig in. He was, he was a leader. He was obviously courageous. He was strong. Here he is at 85 years old, strong as he was at 40. Whether that is because he worked out hard or whether the Lord sustained him, he was strong at 85. That's, he's saying, I'm able to go do the same thing that I was able to do 45 years ago. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's, that's impressive. Uh, he was courageous. We'll get down here later in the story, and we're going to find out he didn't ask for some easy piece of land to just walk into. He asked for the hill country of, of what would become the land of Judah. Yeah, er, earlier on, it was the land, you know, Moses has promised the land that your feet had trodden on. So this must have been the area he spied out. He, and that gives us even another idea because he spied out this part that his, his feet had trod on he knew who was in that land. And he said, hey, I'm ready, to take, I'm ready to take that piece of land. I know who's there. I'm ready to take it. So he was a strong, courageous uh, leader. And I think it's important, and we'll move on down here, that there is a, an understanding that we need to have as men, as Christian men, as men in our culture, that... that, that um, we are under attack. Masculinity is very much under attack in our culture. And I'm not talking about the silly hyper-masculinity that you see on TV. Guys are either gay or they're hyper-ridiculous masculine. There's almost never anymore a picture within anything, on, anything in our culture of a, of a strong, faithful, good man. It's always... Super weak, super gay, super whatever, ridiculously over the top, you know, ridiculous ma masculine, hyper masculinity. And there's never a good view of men within a marriage. 
the man's always an idiot. The wife is kind of dragging him along. Oh, come on, idiot. Let me, let me, let me wipe your face for you. Let me, let me pay your bills for you. Let me, I mean, that's, that's kind of the view that we get within culture. That's kind of the view that we get. And, and, and this, we can't pretend that this hasn't taken some effect. Uh, we, we see, you look around much, and there's mostly very, very heavy, heavy representation of women in leadership in our country. Because a lot of guys have taken a back seat. Eh, I'm not going to get involved. This, you know, who, I'm, just, I'm just too busy. And we see that sometimes in the church a lot. We see that uh, not necessarily in our church. Uh, praise the Lord, Pastor David has been very serious about the need for men to step up and lead. Praise the Lord. That is a, that is a, a rare thing in our culture. It is a very rare thing in the West. Very rare. And so thank, thank God for him for that. Our culture, our freedoms are under attack. Uh, one of the, like I was saying, one of the primary avenues of this attack is to de- destroy men and thereby destroying the family. Uh, God, God uh, designed functional cultures to be based around a family. And if you destroy the head of that family and just, you, you destroy his authority to lead in a home, you'll destroy the family. And that's what we see. There's, there's huge amounts of uh, single motherhood, huge amounts of uh, fathers not getting involved. Even if fathers are there, they're not really leading their homes very often. So it's, it's there. And this, this, we need to be aware of this. And it's, um, we need to be aware of the, you know, the, the culture that was handed down from our grandparents and parents are, is very different now. It's, it has been much, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to say, oh, life is terrible. But we need to be awake. We need to be aware, looking around at what's happening. Caleb did much of this, and, and, and he, he did this thinking of his, his kids, thinking of the, their future, laying out an inheritance that he earned that he can give to them. We need to be thinking of that. What, an, what inheritance, and I don't mean a money inheritance, but what inheritance of freedom, what culture, what legacy of the gospel are we leaving here? Yes, that, our, our main focus needs to be the gospel. But we should also be preserving our land. We should also be preserving our people. And our people are under attack. Ultimately, the gospel is the most important thing. And the gospel can take, take root here in America again, the people of America, when we repent. I think there's a, there's a... You guys are all followers of Christ. And so I'm not saying that we carry this massive burden of sin here, but there, but we need to make sure that we repent of, of lack of courage, repent of weakness, repent of ambivalence, not just, nah, eh, 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 I don't care. It's all going to hell in a handbasket. Jesus will come back soon. Now, we hope, we hope, but we don't know. But we hope, but we need to, we need to live here and leave, try to leave uh, a legacy for our kids to be able to live in freedom and serve Jesus. And if we just throw our hands up and say, ah, we're just going to let them, ah, forget about it, let them have it. That's, God hasn't called us to that. I think many in the church have gotten this idea that they shouldn't be involved politically, they shouldn't be involved culturally, they shouldn't be involved in, in fighting for the future of our kids because, hey, we're going to heaven anyway. No, we need, to be, we need to be involved in fighting for the future of our kids. Think of the fact that all of the north of Africa was Christian. That was, a, that was Christian land. How many people have never heard the gospel or never gotten a chance to live for Christ there? Because Islam came and took over. And here we are letting them in our door. We need to be awake. We need to be awake to, to what's going on. If Islam takes over here, our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids, 
we'll never have a chance. Can God, can God break through? Yes. Yes, but we are also responsible to leave a, leave a legacy of freedom for, it, for the future. The gospel is the, the center of that. I'm not, the gospel is the center of that, but we need to be awake. We need to be aware of what's going on in our culture. So look at Caleb. Caleb comes in. Here, let me read here quick. Um, oh, one thing. So Before I go on to that, think of what Caleb said here. But I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Caleb went to Hebron, where the Anakim were, where the giants were, where the warriors were, and he didn't bring back what he saw. He brought back his faith in God. What was in my heart? I knew God could take care of this. So he didn't bring back this, Batman, it is terrible. And here I am talking about some difficult things. What we face right now, reality, politically in our culture, they're big giants. <laughs> if you don't think it, they are. They're big giants. But Caleb said, these are big giants, but you know what? I'm looking at God. And God said, we're going. We're taking this. And so let's trust God in that. He did the right thing. He, he brought back where it was in his heart, and go back to this, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. He was able to trust what God had said because I wholly followed the Lord my God. And instead, what, what had happened with, these other, with the other guys who came back, they brought back, oh man, it's bad. It's bad out there. It, I, don't think, I don't think we can do it. We don't have enough people and they're big. And we don't have the right guns, and we don't, you know, who knows what exactly they, well, we do know, have a, a record of what they said, but who knows the, the, the murmuring that went on. It, there, we have the record of what they came back and said to Moses, but you know there was this, man, who showed up, well, I don't know, right? And that melted the heart of the people. And so we need to be careful with. What message do we bring? Do we melt the heart of those around us? Or do we remind them, yeah, it looks dark, but man, our God is good. Our God is big. And if we repent, He's given us this promise. If we will pray, those of us who are called by His name, He'll repair this land. If we'll do that. Will we do that? Will we do that? Will you, will you encourage your other brothers? Will you encourage your family? Will you encourage your wife and your kids? Will we do that? And that's the thing I love about Caleb is that he trusted God, but he went and did. He didn't just, oh, God's going to do it and sit on his hands. God will take care of it. What God wills be done. Those are good sayings, but they should be followed up with our faith and our action. Uh, so Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be in your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Remember that he sat there with people who weren't his people for 40 years being disciplined for something he didn't do. He was one of the two people who didn't do what was deserved. And he still, for his children's, uh, for his inheritance, his children's inheritance, he stuck around. Other reasons, he's a fa he was obviously a faithful man, but he stuck around doing what needed to be done, leading those who needed to be led so that he could take a hold of this inheritance. And so I'm just going to challenge you guys with the, the holy follow the Lord. Where do you? Where do you deviate from following the Lord? Is there, is there a sin that that's, you've allowed to reign in your life? Is there something that you know you're supposed to be doing and not? 
I think probably most of us fall in the camp there that we, the Lord's called me to do this thing and I may not be doing it. Or may not uh, be sharing the gospel as I should. I may not be, who, who knows? The Lord has prompted me to, to give here or to, or, to, or to be a part of that. Man, but I just don't have time. Where are you with that? Are you wholly following the Lord? Now, this is not a, a beat down. This is, man, he has good things planned for you. He has good. After all this time, he is being rewarded, even though he walked for many years, not recognizing, not realizing, not taking part of that reward for the good that he did. He took part of that reward. And he took the high ground in all Judea, that's, that's good ground. He was blessed by that ground. James 5, 16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, excuse me, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God loves you. He's a good God and he wants your whole heart. He wants your naked heart. The idea of whole heart is, is the uh, kind of the idea of there's nothing between me and God. There's nothing anyway, but sometimes we like to have this pretense that somehow we're hiding something from God or hiding something from people. Or, but part of this confess your transpasses to one another, that's so that we're able to emotionally take down that wall. Uh, this is no longer my sin. This is no longer my struggle. I brought my brother along. And I told him about it. And he's going to be praying for me. And he'll be checking on me. And it's no longer my sin. But just I'm struggling. Because if it's just your battle, it's harder to fight a battle alone. If you've got a brother with you, you can fight that battle better. So confess your sins. With That's, so that you can be healed. So that you can be healed. We don't be afraid. You need to be selective in who you go share your, <laughs> confess, confess your sins to. They need to be a trustworthy person, but, but don't hold on to things you need to confess. God wants to heal and bless you. Caleb was disciplined like the rest of the children of Israel 40 years as he waited and wandered, but he continued to hold on to the promise that God had made through Moses. Uh, verse 10 through 12. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old. And yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore give me... This mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. He's not roping the Lord in to say, you're going to have to do this. He's going to, for sure, what I want, he's going to do. But he's trusting. I mean, if the Lord will. We're going to drive these guys out, and I'm going. We're going at it. Trusted the Lord with the outcome. As I mentioned earlier, Caleb was a courageous man. And this is a, this is a word, courageous, uh, is, a, is a word that God continues to bring up in my uh, time, time in the Word, and time of study, is, is this idea of courage. It is, it is a virtue that underpins every other virtue. It is, if you want to be an honest person, but what if that honesty might cost you something? You must have courage to stand in that honesty. That goes for everything else. What, what, you want to be a faithful brother? Well, what if that being a faithful brother might cost you something? You're going to have to have courage to stand in your faithfulness. So courage is critical, and I think many of us suffer uh, from a lack of courage, a lack of, of sticking to what we need to do. The Bible lumps cowardice into pretty bad 
uh, company. Revelations 21.8, Revelation 21.8, excuse me. <laughs> but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's a cowardly. <laughs> That's a pretty big list, bad list to be lumped into. So what do you find yourself afraid of? Fear is not by itself a bad thing, but, but buckling to fear is what we're talking about here. So what, what do you find yourself afraid of? A, fe a fear that you buckle to, a fear that you allow to, uh, for me, it's be honest, is, is, is cold approaching someone with the gospel. It, man, I don't always buckle to that fear, but I do mo way, way, way more than I ought to. Knowing God has, God has prompted me to talk to this guy. And man, well, Lord, if they turn around and face me and hold it for 10 seconds and then walk towards me, then I'll talk to them. You know, <laughs> Or they're, you know, they'll get in their car. Lord, if they come back, then I'll talk to them, okay? It's just, I mean, as stupid as that is, as silly, that, that's the reality of, of, of my lack of courage in, that, in many of those situations. I'm probably not alone in that. <laughs> 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 13 through 15. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. It's said three times in this chapter, in 15 verses, that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Hmm. <laughs> That's important. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. And I think it's a blessing for me. This, this is kind of a somewhat of a heavy teaching that we need to be called to be courageous. We need to be called to be willing to fight for, um, for the gospel, willing to fight for our children for our posterity, for their future, against um, the real war that's being waged on our people right now. Revelation 21, 7, right before uh, the verse about cowardliness, says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And then it says, but the cowardly. We, we overcome and are his son, and he is our God, and we will inherit all things because of the gospel, because of his goodness. Not because of our perfection or our immense courage, we should work on these things. There's, there's a reality that, that boots on the ground. We need to be not allowing ourselves to be weak, not allowing ourselves to, to fall to the frailties of our flesh. We will, and God's grace covers that. I do, <laughs> and thank the Lord His grace covers that. But let's not make excuses for it. Call it what it is and repent. Knowing each of you guys, and here it is my assumption that all of you have accepted Christ. It is my knowledge of many of you that accepted Christ. But if for any reason you have not put your faith fully in Him, trusting Him above all things, trusting that what He did on the cross was it, the work is done, there's not more work you have to do in any sense to earn your salvation. Yes, there's work to do, but not for your salvation. That work is done. 
Trust in Him. Put your faith in Him. Holy in Him, your whole heart, into what He has done. Don't leave here today if you haven't done that. I'm going to pray and then we'll split up. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, God, that you would make us courage, courageous men. Willing to fight and not to be afraid. Willing to, um, in spite of uh, tantrums, being willing to lead our children and do the right thing and in spite of how much societal and legal power our wives may have over us, Lord, that you help us to lead in the way that we should lead, to do the right thing. God, I pray for our nation, Lord, that you would heal our land, that you would heal our people. God, I pray, Lord, for your gospel, Lord, to take root again in this place. Lord, help us, God, as, as this little body here in Kernersville, Lord, to, uh, to be effective first at reaching Kernersville. God, help us, Lord, to reach here first, to be a blessing to this community. And then, Lord, uh, may the gospel continue to flow from here. May your light uh, be seen through all the world from here. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.